Okay, so a few of you already know what I'm talking about, and I'll try to take it a step or two further with, with any luck. All right, so how can we better understand customers? Now, I talked to some of my former students who now work at Google, and they told me there's six things that are on their minds. Maybe some of you are interested. They'd like to design products that preserve the Google brand and maybe extend it. They want to solve the problem of getting remote teams from all over the world coordinated with Mountain View. Different countries, different markets have different needs, and they want to know how do we tailor our products to those different places. How do we avoid confusing our customers with too many products? Can we find out what people really want quickly and inexpensively? Because, boy, it's a pain to do these focus groups and these surveys. We need a quick, fast way to do it. And finally, what about products that don't even exist, that customers can't quite relate to yet? How can we find out whether they'll buy in or not? So my goal today is to show you three big ideas, not in great depth because of the time limit, but to at least get you excited about these. Number one, and probably the most interesting one, is a thing I, called, I call stock markets. And you'll see, you'll see what the acronym stands for in a moment, but some of you have heard of a book called The Wisdom of Crowds, and it relates to that idea that a bunch of smart people, or even a bunch of average people, may have more expertise than any one expert. And so we should learn how to listen to that crowd and get their consensus view on something. And your Google internal markets basically gathers the consensus about internal Google issues. I'm going to apply that in a slightly different way. The second thing is if you really want to understand customers, and especially this idea of overloading them with too much stuff, you need to understand how they process information. And specifically, and maybe the number one source of success for Google, if you think about it, is that they need simplicity. People like simplicity. So you have a very simple interface and one little box where you type stuff. You may, even I was able to print my own badge coming to this place. That was impressive. First time I've ever done that in my life. So how do they do that? And so we've developed an algorithm that identifies how each person cuts through all of the complexity to make their life a little easier. That turns out to be important. I'll show you why. And finally, if you ask somebody what do they want, and you ask them again, and you ask them a third time, you'll start getting inconsistent answers. So you can't really be sure what the truth is. In research, we call this error. And we just throw a little epsilon into our equation and say, oh, there's error there. But it turns out that can really confuse somebody who's trying to figure out what should our product be and what trade-off should we really make. And so I've been working on reducing error. And I'll show you how. For any of these methods to be good, what they have to do is predict something, like what will people buy, how many will they buy. They should be fast, so it doesn't cost us too much time or money. They should be cheap on the money side, and they should be easy for both us and customers. And that's really the biggest problem with market research today. It's not these things. It's not good, fast, cheap, or easy. It can be bad on all four dimensions. I'm trying to improve on all four dimensions si simultaneously. All right, the first idea. This is joint work with some colleagues in Germany. In fact, all the work we do runs on their servers, and all the tests have been done in California. So it sort of demonstrates that if you built a solution like this, it could work worldwide re relatively easily. And we're just academics. We don't have the resources of Google to really do this right. But it still works. And the question is, on what dimension would a market, and in this particular case, a stock market, outperform the other methods you might have used to find out what people think, what they want. When I first presented this, this work a, a year ago uh, at a conference in Boston, that day this article appeared. And it basically said that Google was trying this idea. And as far as I can tell, Google, like Microsoft, like Hewlett Packard, like a few other companies that have used this concept, mainly using it internally. What do our own employees think will happen? What will our sales be? How many printers will we sell? Will our software ship on time? And those were all real questions asked by uh, companies such as yours. 
What I'm about to show you is a slight variation on that theme. And instead of predicting a future outcome like sales or ship, it, ship time, I'm trying to measure people's preferences, their opinions, their, their emotions, things like that. So here's the, here's the way this works. This is sort of a, a rough model of how this works. Each of you in the room, if I showed you, say, a cell phone, could have reactions as to whether you like it or not. Let's call that my own personal preferences. But you might also have an opinion about what the other people in the room will say. So if I showed you three cell phones, you might say, well, I know which one of those three I would buy at those prices. And I have a guess as to what percentage of each of the other people in the room would buy. And that's something that we could do in a very simple survey. And in fact, that's exactly what I did at Qualcomm last week. And not just about cell phones, but about 64 different aspects of cell phones. Now, after they think about what they like and what other people might like, I put them in a room together. And in our case, I had about half the people in the room, just about this many people, and even more people sitting at their desks all over the world on a computer. And they were all just tied in through the web. And they played a game. And the question is, how do they play that game? They, winning the game means having successful stock trading, have, you know, making money. You guys know something about making money from stocks, right? I think. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> you do, just by being at this place, you do. So how do, you, how do you know how to make money with stocks? Well, the basic idea is you buy stocks that you think are going up, and you sell the ones you think are going down. And that's how you make money. But here, the only information you've got to help you with that is your own belief about these things I just showed you and your expectations about other people. The amazing thing about this is even though each one of you may be very biased in the process of doing this, and there's pretty good evidence that people are biased, the market pricing that mechanism, the fact that you are trading with each other, leads to some good results. So we're going to look at that. The only key assumption of this, and this is a big assumption, is that the people playing this game want to win. So we have to give them an incentive to want to win. It turns out at Qualcomm and with my own students at UCLA, they want to win because just pride. But you could use money as an inducement as well. So the kind of markets I think you've been running here are what I call information markets, prediction markets, futures markets, event markets. The way they work, and there are many examples that preceded what Google and the companies have done. For example, the most famous is Iowa Electronic Markets that attempts to predict who's going to win an election. There's already a stock called Hillary Wins in 2008. You can find out what is the probability that Hillary Clinton is your next president right now by going to Iowa Electronic Markets. These things are trying to predict an actual outcome, which in the future you'll be able to observe, like an election outcome. They don't necessarily tell you why people believe that. They just tell you this is what people believe. And they typically run up to a year long. So the Iowa electronic markets is already up for the 2008 elections. Uh, the Microsoft and Hewlett Packard markets run a matter of weeks and months. I don't know, how, how, Bo, how long do your markets typically run? About one quarter. About one quarter, so 90 days. How is what I am doing different than this? Well. First of all, I'm not measuring future events or outcomes. I'm, I'm measuring your current preference, what's in your head right now. And there will never be a future outcome that will come true or not. First difference. Second difference is I try to discover the underlying reasons why somebody likes something. So I get down to the granular level of what specific feature did they like or dislike. And finally, my games are all over in under an hour. You're in and out in an hour. If you want it to run longer, you just run another game, basically. That's, those are the differences. And by the way, I used in that previous slide scalable preference markets. You see that in the upper right. You'll see in a minute that due to a little bit of creativity and good luck, we figured out a way to make this thing infinitely scalable. You give me more people to play, I can handle more and more questions. I'll show you how we do that. So the category that I'm going to use for the rest of the time we have together is this category of smartphones. But don't get obsessed with smartphones. This could apply to basically anything that people can get their hands around, including 
vague concepts of a software product, user interfaces, uh, new services you might offer. It doesn't have to be a physical object. But I've done a lot of research on smartphones, and what's nice about that is I've, I've got data going back five or six years now. I started this work about six years ago, and we can compare over time what's happened. So here's the kind of question you might ask. Let's say you're Motorola, and it's a month ago, right? It's middle of May, let's say. And you have to decide what should we launch as a cell phone, a smartphone in particular. And a smartphone is, how many of you already own smartphones that can do email, web browsing, etc.? How many of you are thinking about getting one in the next year? All right, so I, we want to tap into that market. And the Motorola Q phone that I show you here was announced relatively recently, about the time, after the time that I'm talking about. What should it be? How can it compete with these other five products? So going back a few years when I was at MIT, we did this research. We built a user interface. One screen, you saw everything you needed. Basically, a list of stocks and how they're trading, prices up and down. We created a list of stocks that people could trade. And here you see 14 stocks, and they represent, and this is the part people have the hardest time getting their hands around typically, what, is, what does one of these stocks mean? Well, it's the percentage of people who would pay an extra $10 to uh, have a smaller cell phone. The percentage of people who, in this case, this could have been a PDA without even cell phone capabilities. So turn your PDA smaller, 10 bucks, save three ounces. And these are a whole list of trade-offs. And the simple thing you'd put in these boxes is what percentage of the people would have chosen those things. So we had MIT students trade. And this is what happened. If you compare how they answered surveys versus the stock prices, you got pretty good results. This is an R squared of 0.59. It's pretty decent. And then you say, well, these were students, and they had filled out these surveys. What if we brought in? executives who had never done the survey exercise, and I had 241 students actually fill out surveys on what they'd buy. These executives didn't fill out any surveys. They just traded stocks in about 30 minutes. Their results were even better. Their results basically predicted what happened in the survey. R squared of 0.87, which is in, in, in my kind of research is considered pretty good. So very happy. Our first attempt at this, and the thing can can pretty much predict people's preferences. OK. Showed this around the country. People liked it a lot. But they said, well, what's so magical about it? It's, you know, the survey could have given you the same information. And then I realized what makes stock markets extraordinary is the volume of information they can handle. Every day, right, you know, just today, uh, 5,000 plus stocks got traded by millions of people. And every one of them has a price, and everyone now has an opinion of what it's worth. How does that happen? Well, it happens because in normal research, everybody answers the same 20 questions, basically. You give them 100 questions, they start getting really upset. So you give them 20 questions, they answer them, you collect it and send it to the statisticians. In stocks, what you can do is a little different. You can have one little group of people trade or answer 20 questions, and another group answer a different 20 questions, and so on and so forth. Think about how each of you might have a stock portfolio. You'd each be focused on 20, 30 stocks, but together you could trade 5,000 stocks. So we're going to use that principle. Where's an example where we could have a whole lot of stocks, where we'd need that kind of capability? Well, smartphones. Turns out we sat down and just made a list of all the things that might make someone like a smartphone or not. And this is just a short list. And we eventually turned it into 56 stocks. And this was two years ago. This was 2004. I had the students in my classes look at these things. And on a vacation day, when they didn't have to be in school, I invited whoever wanted to to show up and trade. And 113 people showed up, which was about 90% of the people. It was the first test that they passed, that they were willing to do this because it seemed fun. And again, for each one of these, the theoretical question, the value of the stock, is what percentage of people would have picked each one of these things? Before we get to the result of the stock game, though, we did two surveys. The first survey was, would you buy this thing for yourself? 
And I had 117 people answer that question. So these are simple percentages. 100 means everybody said they'd buy it. Zero means nobody would buy it. 50% means half the people said they'd buy it, half would not, okay? And I'm going to compare that against the second survey question I asked, which is what do you think everybody else is going to say? What percentage of the people are going to answer each of these things? So the question we're raising here is, are people good at predicting what other people will say? This is sort of the wisdom of the crowds idea. If they're good, they will line up along this 45 degree line. So this is two years ago, 117 students and, uh, at UCLA, and here was the result. Turns out people are pretty darn good at predicting what other people will answer. So this ability of you to take your own preference and sort of project what other people will do, not half bad. But when you run a regression through this, you see the line's not really 45, it's a little tilted down. So basically, people are a little conservative. They're not as extreme as the people actually are. Did the same exercise at Qualcomm last week, got really good results again. This was people predicting what the other Qualcomm employees would say. And roughly the same regression line. This tilting means people are a little conservative about how extreme their colleagues are going to be. And the R squareds were pretty good. Roughly 30, you know, roughly 75% of the, the variability in individual answers were explained by people's guesses. So there is wisdom of crowds. This is evidence of it. Now, will it work in the stock market? Okay. By the way, before I leave this result, I just want you to know something. The very best person guessing, so this is the averages across all the people. This is kind of aggregating everybody. The very best guesser was around a 0.6, and the very worst was around a zero. So some people were really bad guessers. The very best was a 0.6. When I aggregate them, I improve. Let's see what happens in the stock market. Uh, before we leave the survey, I just want you to know there's strong evidence that each person was very biased by their own preferences. So if I liked a feature, I said other people will like it. And if I didn't like it, I said other people wouldn't like it. And that happened about 87% of the time. Okay, so basically 87% of the time, 87% of the options, people were biased by their own preference. The market's going to correct this in a minute. So here's how we did this. Each person came to a website, slightly modified version of what I showed you before, it listed their stocks, and they became a member of a group. They didn't know that they were a member of a group, but behind the scenes, each person was assigned to a group. And so they only saw a subset of the 56 stocks. They saw 20 in this case. They learned a little bit about the stocks. They saw pictures. They could see graphs of how the prices were moving. And they saw a thing we call the order book. Do you use an order book in yours too? Okay, so they could see who's willing to buy and who's willing to sell and what the supply and demand for each stock was. Here's the experimental design that allowed me to have people only look at 20 stocks at a time and yet trade 56 stocks. There were six groups of people and roughly 17 to 21 people in each group and they were each trading 20 stocks and you see there's some overlap. I think this is an innovation we kind of pioneered realizing that the real stock market works this way and we could apply it. But in our case, we control who, who sees which stocks. Right? You could envision a case where people could self-select the 20 stocks, their favorite ones, the ones they know the most about. That might even be better. And here was the result. In about 35, 40 minutes, we had an R squared of 0.56. We just randomly stopped these games after about 30 to 40 minutes. And so people's stock trading very much was in agreement with the surveys we had done. How about Qualcomm last week? What do you think, better or worse? Any guesses? The students were all MBAs. The Qualcomm people were all sort of mainly technical folks, engineers and so on, who happened to know a lot about cell phones. Worse? Better. I was positive it was going to be a lot worse. I was positive it was better. It was better, and I want to tell you, it astonished me for a whole lot of reasons. They're not professional traders. They barely could figure out the interface in the first 10 minutes. And 
half the number of people showed up. So I had 113 traders on the left. I only had 62 traders on the right. On the right, instead of 56 stocks, I had 64 stocks. More stocks, less time, half the number of traders. They did phenomenally well. And I just want to remind you, the best guesser in the entire group of 62 had an R squared of 0.61. The average R squared was 0.3, but when they traded stocks, it's almost 0.7. It beats every single one of them. By the way, I had as an experiment my daughter, my 16-year-old daughter, try to guess the value of these 64 stocks. She got 0.56. She's in the 95th percentile of Qualcomm engineers at figuring out what people want on smartphones. All right, so again, two good results. You see, by the way, not only are the R squareds decent, but they line up on the 45-degree line, which is what we want to see. Here's a very important question. Did they like it? Did they like doing this? They had no reason to lie about this. And the way I worded the question was, what did you like better, the stock trading or the survey? And this was stuff relevant to both groups because they were studying this. The students liked it a whole lot more. 85% of the students said they preferred it. And the Qualcomm folks, 89% of the people, whoops, 89% of the people preferred it. I would expect this result to sustain. People don't like doing market research surveys. They do like competing in stock games. That's important. So conclusion, it's scalable because of this experimental design. It costs less because you can do it quickly and they like doing it. You get good response rates and they care about giving you the truth because they want to win. Not because they're trying to tell you the truth, but because they want to win. A big, big impact. They learn from each other. By watching these prices, they learn from each other. And we deal with a lot of the biases that I showed you earlier, where you think everybody else is going to like what you like and hate what you hate. The market mechanism controls for that. Two problems. This is only for aggregate data. I can't tell you anything about each person and their unique heterogeneous preferences. And I have to get people on the web at the same time. I'm going to show you two other quick ideas uh, but not get into them in the same level of depth, and then have a few questions. So fine, we use the stock me mechanism to identify the important attributes of a smartphone, but what we really want to know is how do they pick a smartphone? What actually happens when they're trying to decide which internet service provider, which website to go to, which smartphone to buy? So this is work with three colleagues at MIT, and. A couple of them are operations research geniuses, and the other two guys, myself and John Hauser, are simple old marketing guys. Here's the basic idea. Imagine there's a, a fellow by the name of Alex Bell, and we want to know how he's going to pick phones. How does he buy a phone? Well, he might say, you know, phones could have flip phone or not. They could have a mini keyboard or not. Could be this brand. Could be that service provider. Could be this size. And they might assign values to having each of those features. And what you see about these numbers is an interesting thing, which is that Alex is basically making trade-offs. And what do I mean by that? Any one feature could be offset by having any of two of the others. You see that with the numbers? So flip, which is worth 10 points, can be offset by any other two features. So it becomes a trade-off. Okay. Alternatively, he might assign points like this in which case any one feature will not offset the others. If I have a flip phone, doesn't matter if I have these four things, because you add up these four numbers, they don't cover 16 points. It turns out that for most decisions, people are more like this. They use this kind of mentality as a way to simplify their life and eliminate lots of stuff. And the question is, can you identify this? It turns out to be a very difficult uh, problem that's been worked on for about 30 years and hasn't been solved until now. Uh, and, and I'll tell you just briefly, briefly the, the solution. These are examples. It's just an interesting example that coins in the United States and actually everywhere else in the world that we find are lexicographic. That means any one coin is worth more than the sum of all the coins below it. That's not a coincidence. So if I showed you plates of coins, any combination of single coins, you could immediately put them in order just by saying the ones with the dollar coins always beat anything with the silver dollars, which beat anything with the quarters, and so on. 
Okay, and that's because of this two to one relationship in the numbers. All right, exemplified by that. Now, by the way, the same is true with currency. So if I showed you, you know, you went to Best Buy or something or Fry's and you saw a whole bunch of phones like that sitting there and I told you pick one, you'd go nuts trying to rank order these phones. And that's the task we give people to do typically in market research. Uh, why would you go nuts? Because there's a, literally a billion, 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 billion ways to do it. And so are we surprised that when we give people that task, they make errors? We shouldn't be surprised. They can't possibly keep track of all that they're doing, so they come up with these simplifying tasks. So the last two ideas, real quickly, are one, can we identify the process of elimination, and two is can we keep people consistent? To make a long story short, process of elimination would look something like this. I'll only consider a flip phone. It's got to have a mini keyboard, and it's got to be from BlackBerry. That el eliminates most of the phones, and now you're down to two or three, maybe you pick one. Okay. The question is, for each person, that's going to be different. How do you identify it? And just to make it clear, these are four different people. Think of it as four different people. They all, have, they all are, are in agreement. Spades are better than hearts. Hearts are better than diamonds and so on. Aces are always better than jacks. And yet, depending on how they make that rule, even though they're all in agreement, by the time they get to the fifth card, they've all diverged. Their ranking, their choice of which product to pick would be different. So it turns out it's hard to identify this, and the long and the short of it is with the OR geniuses we got to work with, turns out you can use a greedy algorithm to solve this and some nifty computer programming, and that's what we did, and we tested it with the phones, and it was good, <laughs> all right? It, it basically cut the time dramatically that people needed, and it, uh, it predicted what people picked in outside tests that we ran, and it beat the state of the art that's used in market research today, which is a thing called hierarchical Bayes ranked logit. So what I want you to take away from that is stock can get from 64 features to the really important ones, and this technique can tell you exactly how each person is wading through all the options. So, for example, it turns out with students, the number one way they pick a smartphone is they reject the expensive ones. That's the first thing they do. Then they pick the flip phone. Then they pick the small size. By that time, you've eliminated most of them. The last idea. And actually, would you rather hear about the last idea or take a couple questions now? I leave it up to you guys. How many of you want the last idea? How many of you would rather do questions? All right, you lose. <laughs> so I'll be quick, though, I promise. The last idea is this. How many of you have ever used a navigation system in a car? You've used it. You know how you enter the street? So you type the first letter of the street name, and then there's like a little mini keyboard that you're touching or clicking on, and then as soon as you type the first letter, most of the other letters get grayed out or disappear, and you're only left with a few letters? Why is that? Well, that's because they're looking at a dictionary of street names, and they don't want you to type, you know, QZ. If they know that after a Q, it's got to be a U, right? So why let you make that error? Well, you can apply the same thing. That's what consistency is. It says, I'm going to guide people to get right to the thing they're interested in. So imagine if Google could implement a thing like this. Somebody says, I want a Maui vacation, and what you bring up on the screen is exactly what they want to see in the order they want to see it. That's a hard thing to do. Now, you get really close with your algorithms, but that's what I'm striving for. So, how do I do it? Well, what I do is I use the fact that I'm only going to let them go on real street names. I'm only going to let them give me answers that are consistent with some known possible answer that I'm looking for. And I list all the possible answers they might give me, and I guide them to one of those. Uh, I have a demo I can show it to you. You can see what this thing feels like. It basically eliminates things off the screen that make no sense. So I typically show people something like phones or iPods or whatever the product category is. And think of it this way. How do I do it? Well, if I knew that Alex Bell had that utility function, right? If I knew that that's how he was weighting things, then I would know exactly how he'd answer all my questions, right? 
If I knew this in advance, I'd know he'd pick this, then this, then this. Well, I list out all the possible behaviors that someone might have, and then I only let them go down one of those paths. That's how consistency works. Maybe if you see it, it'll make more sense. And I basically make a database, and database doesn't have to be six billion possibilities. The database could be there's a thousand possible people types out there, and I'm going to find out which of the thousand types you are and guide you down that path. It turns out that in two or three clicks, I can nail it. All right. So uh, the payoff of doing this is that it's very accurate, it's super fast, it costs a lot less, and people love it because it cuts out the effort in answering your questions just very dramatically. Reduced effort in, in our experiment by 73%. It's also scalable. As your computers get larger, you can handle more and more people types. You can learn every time they click, you know something more about them. So even if they stop midway, you know you've narrowed things down. And they only have to tell you things they like. They don't have to start answering all sorts of questions about things they don't like. So to wrap up, Three ideas. The stock method is going to narrow things down. The process of elimination is going to keep you in the game. You've got to know how not to get eliminated. And we can get people to be consistent in their answers just by having the computer guide them a little bit. Um, I do have a little demo if you want to just see how this thing works. Uh, I'll save that until you, until you ask me to see it. Uh, and, and I guess now we can open it up for a few questions. Uh, yes. Okay. The question. Okay. So the question, the question was, what are the people actually trading in the stock game? What they're trading is a stock that I've defined for them. Specifically, it represents the percentage of people. So it's a number between zero and a hundred percent. Percentage of people that picked a certain option. So let's say you wanted to know. What percentage of people prefer a metallic blue cell phone? Well, I showed people questions like metallic blue cell phone, pink cell phone, green, silver, gold, and black. There's six choices. Everybody answered the question. I happen to know what percentage each one picked. They don't know that. They only know which one they picked. And they have to basically guess what percentage of people picked a metallic blue cell phone. The real number is something like, I don't know, 8 10%. That stock price should converge to about 8 or $10, and it does. It does with about 70% accuracy in 30 minutes or less. Is it still confusing? Let me tell you, defining the stocks is the thing that took me the longest to get my hands around. Okay, so when you start out the game, let's see if I can get back to the user interface to show you. When you start out the game, you see a portfolio of stocks. These are these zero to 100 sorts of things. So it's hard to read from back there, but the first one says Cell Network Nextel. The second one is Cell Network Sprint. So there are four cell networks, Nextel, Sprint, Singular, and Verizon. And you start out the game with 100 shares of each of those with no, pr no price. We don't know what the price is. They're blank prices. You own 100 shares of each. Let me just ask you, do you have a cell phone? What network is it on? Which one? Singular. Singular. Okay, so Singular is the third one there. What percentage of the people in the room would you guess are on Singular? 30%. Now, we could actually find out right now. But the astonishing thing is without finding out, just playing the game in this room, I could make a pretty good guess as to what percentage of you have Singular, just because you each know which one you've got, and you have an expectation of what, like you just heard, 30%. What's your name again? Robbie. So is it Robbie? Yeah. 
So Robbie's expectation of all of you is that 30% of you use singular. He should believe in his heart that that stock is worth $30. If the price in the market is 50, what's Robbie going to do? What should he do? He should sell, sell, sell. Oh, these suckers, they think it's worth 50. I know it's worth 30. He'll sell. That will put downward pressure on the price. Some of you think, oh, no, no, I happen to know that at Google, 60% of the people use singular. You're going to be buy, buy, buying. And that's exactly what happens. And in fact, the way this works is a transaction only occurs if one of you is willing to buy and another one of you is willing to sell. I have no market makers, which really makes this hard because 30 minutes, 60 people, it's hard to get them to trade enough, but they do. And I give them huge rewards. I walked down to Qualcomm with six baseball caps, UCLA baseball caps. That's what they were playing for. Now, then after the survey's over, you ask, well, why were you working so hard? Because they're really going crazy and they're trying to win. You know, pride. I want to be, you know, can you imagine saying, I beat all the other Googlers at the stock game? What do you do, Bo, for your winners? Do they get anything? thousand dollars. All right, so just so you know, these guys are going to kill me. You don't need to give them anything. <laughs> They'll play just as hard for nothing. My students came in, I've done it for zero, I've done it for fifty dollars, and I've done it for serious money. No difference. People like winning. Now, in the long run, especially within a company, you need to compensate people. Maybe it gets into your reviews if you're a good player, or you give them the thousand bucks because you want them to play a lot. You want them to come every time and play. And, and they deserve the thousand because they're giving great information by playing this game. Yes? So that's a very insightful question, because nothing about what we've done here says that you have to be predicting what the other traders prefer. Personally, it could be our consensus view of what Joe Bloggs in the middle of the you know, country will buy. And the key issue is, do those people have insight? Do the traders have insight about the, the group? Most of my experiments are about one group predicting people similar to themselves. Because I think that then I'm pretty sure they have insight about themselves. But I've done tests where people who've never met, you know, people who are 30, 40 years older, have never met the original group, never took the study that the original group did, and just jump in. And you saw one of those where the executives did it for the MBA students, and their R squared was the highest I've ever gotten of 0.87. So my answer would be as long as they have insight. The more they can learn about people, about the preferences, about the details of the products, the likelier you are, the more likely you are to get good results. Okay, so my second question was about, um, you were saying that the results are better the more the people want to win. So can you potentially look at the behavior of the people that are trading and adjust it based on you count more from the people who uh, are doing higher volume trading or other things okay. like that? Would you get better results so, maybe? So that little can of worms you've just opened is one of my favorites. Can I tell you anything about a person based on how well they trade, how intensely they trade, and most importantly of all, whether they win? Can I say, for example, if you're a winner, oh, you have greater insight about this market than other people? The answer is every test we've run so far, the answer is no. Right? I don't know why that is. And I ask the people who win these games, how, what did you ex exactly do to come out 10% better than anybody else in the room. And they, they always answer, oh, I found this one stock that was being neglected. You know, the, the market said it was worth $5, which means 5%. But in fact, I really thought it was worth at least 10%. And I just bought it like crazy. And I sold out everything else and went whole hog on this one stock. So yeah, that person had insight about that one stock. But do they have insight about the other 63? Answer, no. You can actually test for it statistically. 
So I, the answer is I cannot tell you anything about which people drive the overall game. What I can tell you is which people drive each stock. And they are what we would call the marginal trader. The marginal trader is the person who's willing to buy or sell in significant volumes whenever that price is off of the number they believe to be true. And they have confidence in that number and they drive the price. Right? And those people self-select stock by stock. They know about a particular feature. But I have not been able to tell you, you know, take all your Google folks and, and have them trade for like a year, and then now you can identify your 100 best people who should always trade from now on. It doesn't work. At least I have not found that result yet. Been looking for it, haven't found it. Real quick question before we wrap up. How many of you, uh, Bo, you got to close your eyes for a second. How many of you love playing these Google stock games the way they are now? How many of you don't like it so much? How many of you are afraid to raise your hand at the moment? <laughs> okay, so we didn't get any feedback on this. You could probably run a stock game to find out what people think of the stock game. Uh, that would be, yes. Uh, are you familiar with a field of combinatorics called design of experiments? Absolutely. So it seems that that overlapping thing that you were doing is, is just that? That's true, and it's the first time that I'm aware of that it was applied to this field. Ah, I see. But it was sitting there, low-hanging fruit, for the, ripe for the plucking. And it's perfect, because you know, here, here's my theory as to why nobody's ever done it before. Mm -hmm. In the real stock market, such a thing would be unacceptable. You know, we, we use the real stock market as sort of the mental model for what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. In the real stock market, you can't tell people, you, you must own these and you can't own those. Ah. But this is a game. Mm -hmm. So no problem. And in fact, I've been thinking long and hard about that experimental design and what possibilities it might offer. It offers incredibly exciting opportunities. Let me just give you a few that I've thought of. One, you could run the same stock market 15 times simultaneously and compare the results. If you, if you, you, know, you want to know how confident am I in my results, there's just multiple versions of the same stock, and you just assign different ones to different groups, but they're all connected by some stocks. That market will equilibrate, and you'll get 15 repetitions of the same experiment. That's one example. Second example, what if you want to know how much will people pay? And I actually ran this experiment in Qualcomm. They don't know it yet, but I did. <laughs> you offer a feature. Each of these features typically comes with a price tag, right? I say, for example, uh, Blackberry 7100T, that's the little cute Blackberry that uh, they've slimmed down now. I show it at $299. Well, what if I want to get a demand curve, a demand function, to know how price sensitive are people about this? I just offer seven versions of that stock, and I just change that price. I'll get seven numbers back, and I can plot a demand curve. Those are just two examples. You could run multiple versions. You could run price sensitivity. Uh, you can do all sorts of stuff with experimental design applied to stock markets. And I wasn't sure that my computer guys in Germany could figure out how to assign an individual person to an individual set of stocks where the set of stocks was part of a universe that's tradable by everybody. Turns out they did it in, in a day. So I kind of have a feeling you guys might be able to do that with a little work. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's the future. Of the, that makes it infinitely scalable. You just give me more traders, I can handle more questions. Oh, so, by the way, so one last thing. This, oh, yeah, sorry. So you would say design of experiments could probably be useful at Google. I've been trying to convince people of this for, like, months, but nobody has. Not only can it generally be useful, but it's outrageously useful for this. Uh-huh. Look at it this Thanks. way. Right. Did I just say the wrong thing? <laughs> no. So, so look at it this way. A third possibility you could do. You could run 10 markets simultaneously. Right? The way most people would run 10 markets. So what's a typical market, Bo? That you guys, what's the last market you guys ran here without disclosing anything too sensitive? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'll repeat it. When will Gmail go out of beta? So a certain large operating system company asked exactly that same question about a piece of software of which I'm not aware. And they offered stocks 
two months early, one month early, on time, one month late, two months late, three months late, all the way up to six months late. And of course, six months late was the high price stock and the product shipped six months late. Okay, um, that was, that's public information because it was presented at a conference in New Jersey. You could have run that conference, that stock game simultaneously with who's gonna win the World Cup using experimental design. There's no reason that you had to run one for that, another one for World Cup soccer, and another one for smartphone features. Just, and, and the participants, you could even say, well, which market do you, are you interested in? You know, World Cup, timeliness of a piece of software, or, sm or smartphones, they pick one and they join the group where they see those stocks. But in fact, all the stocks are being traded like the 5,000 Wilshire 5,000 stocks. And the reason that's important, you might say, well, why, what's the benefit of that? Is the e equilibrium across all the stocks. That's a key element here. It's the fact that some people holding certain stocks here are trading with other groups that hold similar stocks. And so the price equilibrium happens across all the stocks. Right? That's, I mean, try to imagine a world where high tech companies had their own stock market and people who held those stocks could not buy or sell, you know, Dow Jones type stocks or, or uh, you know, food stocks, or agriculture or international. Each market can't, can't hold multiple ones. That would not produce as good an equilibrium. So that's why this design of experiments is important. I feel that that particular thing alone was, was an exciting discovery. But when we added a couple other things, like the notion of breaking a product down into little features, that, that was sort of unusual. That hasn't been done as far as I know. And it all seems to be working, at least so far. I'd love to do this on a larger scale, using either you guys or your, you know, some beta site, and prove that it works with real people out, out in the world. That's the one thing we haven't quite done yet. We've done it with executives and companies. We've done it with students. It'd be nice to test it with real, real folks, see if they could learn how to trade and so on. OK. Well, thank you very much. Oh, we have one, have wait, wait, wait. We have one more question. So is this a system you are licensing or setting, or uh, are you working with some people in the group, I mean, in Google? Yeah, mi million dollars a copy. <laughs> Work it over. Unfortunately, we academics are kind of dumb about this stuff. Everything that I do is I give away pretty much. The p piece of software that I'm using, I've used now two or three pieces of software. I, I'm not really, you know, I'm agnostic about the software. As long as it's a database, quick database that trades between people, it's fine with me. Um, the colleagues in Germany who wrote this particular one are thinking about licensing it. And my expectation is that sometime within the next year or two, a Google or a Yahoo or some small player is going to make this just like totally available. It won't be a big deal. It'll be, you know how putting a website up used to be a big deal and now it's not? It's going to be like that. The real action here is not going to be the software that allows trading. It's going to be who can figure out how to define stocks cleverly and teach people how to trade and get people to come and do it. That's, that's going to be the challenge, not the underlying software. I, do you, did you guys, I assume you wrote your own software here to do the trading. And it takes a little effort to do it and have a, use a database of some sort in the background, I assume. You need a database. It's got to be able to do quick transactions to match people up. That's about it. So yeah, think of it as free. And you, you guys are probably in the best position to build a platform where companies and individuals around the world could do this. You know, how many stocks do you want to set up? 52? Okay, type the names in, download some pictures. Okay, you're ready to trade. And then they just go run their trading game. You just give them a URL, send everybody to the URL, have them log in, and you're ready to roll. I do these games, by the way, in about, from the moment we thought of the Qualcomm one to the time we ran it was a matter of a few weeks. The actual time involved was on the order of three, four days of effort. I want to get that down to 10 or 15 minutes of effort, but it's not that hard to do. It's the easiest piece of market research I ever do, is the, are these games. OK, any more questions? All right, well, it's been a real honor, honestly, to be here. And I hope I get to come back and talk to you about other stuff in the future. Thanks so much for coming.